Way back at the beginning of this course, in chapter one, we defined something called a free, a free variable. And the way we described a free variable was to say that we, we couldn't necessarily find uh, an exact value for that, for that variable in a solution to a system of equations, but we could write a solution to a system of equations based on the idea that one of our variables could continue to vary, that we could select multiple values for that variable and that the basic variables then would depend on the value we chose for the free variable, and we'd have multiple solutions. Here's the example that we did at the beginning of the course. This is participation activity 1.5.1. Now, back then, we didn't know how to do Gauss elimination, let alone uh, Gauss-Jordan elimination. So all we had to go on was the fact that I could write this as the second row could be written as x2, minus 2x3 equals 8, and the top row can be written as x1 plus 2x2 minus x3 equals 4. And then with a little bit of uh, algebra and arithmetic, I could solve for one of these variables, plug that into the other, and I'd have a, a slightly different system of equations that at least at that point would only have one variable left in it. Here I've only got two equations though. So it's kind of a dead giveaway that I'm going to have at least one free variable. All right, let's erase that, and let's use some of the techniques we actually know now. If I take 2 times, sorry, negative 2 times the second row and add it to the first row, that'll turn this into a 0. So let's do that. All right, there's my 0 now in that position. And multiplying negative 2 times all of these, it gave me these new values, negative 2 times 8 is negative 16, negative 16 plus 4 is negative 12. And now what I'll do is, let's see, what's the next step here? I want to turn, well, ideally, so I've got all my, my pivot columns are now all have leading, are, all have ones in their pivot positions. Uh, this last column here can't be converted, and that's actually how we know that we have uh, a free variable here. Uh, but let's take a look at what this means. How does this translate back into a system of equations? This tells me that x1 plus 3 x3 equals negative 12. And the second line tells me that x2 minus 2 x3 equals 4. And again, a little algebra here. Actually, I'm going to go down to the next line. You can see that what each of these, what these two equations have in common is x3. So if I solve each equation for the other variable, not x3, that in the first case that's going to be solved for x1, and the second equation is x2 minus 2 x3 equals 4. So in this equation, I'm going to be solving for x2. And what I'll get here is, let's see, x1 is 3x3, oops, negative 3x3. Negative 3x3 minus 12. And for this equation, I get x1 equals 2x3 plus 4. And so what I have here is, oh, that's an x2, sorry, not an x3, not an x1, x2. Uh, what I have here is uh, an x1, an x2, and an x3, right? This is my solution vector, I would call it now. But what I know about x1 is that I can write it as negative 3 x3 minus 12. And what I know about x2 is that I can write it as 2 x3 plus 4. And x3 is just x3. Right? Now using vector addition, I could write this as, I'm actually going to do two steps in one here because I think you can handle that at this point. Negative 3, 2, and 1 times the unknown constant number x3 plus the constant vector negative 12 4 0 right and x3 is what we called a free variable 
it's free to roam all around the, the, the real numbers, and whatever value we pick for x3 will determine also then the values that we get for x1 and x2. So there are multiple solutions to this system of equations. Another way that I could write this system or this solution would be that it's a set of vectors. There are multiple solutions here, multiple values anyway. It's a set, and that is a set made up of the vectors, the vector x1, x2, x3, where the following is true. This line is usually read such that, but that means so that, or in order that, or because of. So what I'm saying here is S is a set of all vectors that look like this, so that what follows that line is true. So that x1 is built this way based on the value of x3, and x2 is determined this way based on the value of x3, and x3 is the thing that varies, right? So the set of all vectors that look like this, where these two components are determined using these formulas. What we're going to do now is something very similar but kind of backwards from this process. We're going to take a look at a subspace of R3, which is, that's what this is here, right? This is a subspace of R3. It's a collection of vectors in R3. It may not be a basis, it may not be a span, but it's a, a subspace. I'm going to take a look at a subspace that's defined in a, a way very similar to this, and we're going to see what we can do to find a basis for that subspace. Okay, so on the next screen, I'll show you the notation for that subspace, and we'll talk about what it means, and then we'll go about finding a basis. This notation is a little bit different from the notation we were using before. Um, that's not a problem. It's uh, a slightly different context, so it's not terribly surprising. The previous slide really was just to show you the setup and kind of remind you what that meant. And so what we're seeing here now is we've basically got a collection of uh, a whole bunch of vectors in R3, and we're going to build them based on this relationship. Like I said, it's a little bit different, but it's a similar idea. If I take the equation that's written out here off to the side, I'll write that over here, x plus y minus z equals zero, and I solve it for one of the variables. I think I'll solve it for z. If I just add z to both sides, I get x plus y equals z, or z equals x plus y. That suggests that both x and y are free variables, and z depends on the relationship between the two. So it's a very similar thing. So my, ve my vectors then, x, y, z, are all going to look like this. Z, I know, has to be written as x plus y. So whatever x and y are, I add them together to get z. And y and x are just y and x. So all of my vectors will look like that. Again, using vector addition, I can write this as x, 0, x, and 0, y, y. And adding these two vectors together would give me x plus 0, which is x, 0 plus y, which is y, and x plus y, which is x plus y. And then if I factor out the, the common unknown value x, I get a vector 1, 0, 1 times x, which you might see as x times 1, 0, 1. And I get a vector 0, 1, 1 times y, which can also be written as y times 0, 1, 1. Now here's the cool part. x and y are variables, but variables represent numbers. So these are scalars. x is scaling this ve uh, vector, y is scaling this vector, and so what I have here is two vectors, 1, 0, 1. Oops, not plus. And 0, 1, 1 which when you scale them and add them together in multiple different combinations, we get a linear combination. 
because x and y can vary. I get lots of linear combinations. In fact, since x and y can be any real number, I get all the possible linear combinations. And so this pair of vectors here is actually the span of s this collection up here. Now this is a whole bunch of vectors. It's all the vectors where uh, the z value is determined by adding x and y together. Take x, whatever that happens to be, take y, whatever that happens to be. To get z, add those two values together. You can do that in innumerable ways, right? But as it turns out, the vectors that we sort of extracted from this process are uh, they span this the space of s they span so i only need these two vectors to span all of s because s is already built in such a way that z depends on x and y let's also check these for linear dependence or independence and write down my two column vectors here and then add a third zero column and row reduce this matrix and what I want for independence is for the last row to be zeros. Now see, the first two rows are already in the form that they need to be in, 1, 0, 0, and 0, 1, 0. And the third row, if I take the opposite of row 1 and add it to row 3, I get negative 1 plus 1, 0 plus 1, and 0 plus 0. And that, in turn, gives me 1, 0, 0, because rows 2 and 3 are the same, if I, if I add the opposite of 1 to the other, I get a row of zeros. So that tells me that these two vectors are also linearly independent. So if they're linearly independent and they span the space, they form a basis. So not only are these two vectors a span of the space, but they are a basis of the space. In this case, the basis or the space that we're working with is defined by this expression here. S is equal to the space made up of these vectors, the vectors we build doing this. S is the, the name of the space, and these two vectors are a span of that space, but also because they're linearly independent, they're a basis of that space. It's worth noting here that I can tell that this space uh, is a plane. I know this is a plane, the vectors are all coplanar, and the reason I know that is because I know that this is the equation of a plane. Depending on your background, you may or may not know that, but this is the equation of a plane, and so all the vectors in this space are coplanar. That doesn't necessarily mean that this is in R2. R2 is specifically defined as the xy plane. Right? Let me put a quick sketch down here. This is R2. Well, that's one quadrant in R2. Actually, goes on forever in, oops, and is expressed in four different quadrants, right? But that's R2. This could be a plane. I keep grabbing the wrong pen. This could be a plane that looks maybe something like this or something. It's still a plane, it's just not the plane we call R2. So it makes sense that there are only two vectors in this basis, in this span, uh, because we're trying to define a plane here. It's just that we can't call it R2 because we don't know that it's that particular plane. We just know it's a plane. 